For as long as there has been competition, there have been competitors looking to gain the upper hand. I've got six pieces, Whether it be ancient Olympians literally trying to curse their opponents by hiding hexes in gymnasiums and racetracks, the steroid scandal of Major League Baseball in the 90s and 2000s, or looking at your buddy's screen during a game of GoldenEye 007 for the N64, rules and regulatory bodies have had to keep up with the times in order to maintain the competitive integrity of any given sport. Ancient Olympians were fined with the money going towards the statues, the MLB implemented a strict performance-enhancing drug policy, and I swear to God, Hunter, if you keep looking at my screen, I'm calling my big brother to beat you up. In that sense, fighting games aren't really any different. We've seen plenty of the weird and creative ways that fighters have tried to get ahead. In-person intimidation, tanking in a grand finals so your buddy can get more ranking points, or simply trying to play in a tournament that you've already lost out of. But one of the more legal and accepted ways to improve your placements is to, simply put, Just pick a top tier. Just pick them. Yo, pick, pick a top tier. You wanna win, yo? Pick a fucking top tier. I don't even like- But what happens when a character is too top tier? Prevailing logic states that you would just ban that character from competitive play, right? It's a bit more complicated than that. The fighting game community generally resorts to banning characters as a last resort, but there are a few special circumstances where the ban hammer can be dropped, so today I'd like to talk about those special circumstances. But before we begin, I would appreciate your support in the form of a subscription on YouTube and a follow on Twitter. Fighting game single-player content has evolved quite a bit over the genre's lifetime. I made a pretty good video about it in my opinion. More modes and reasons to play by yourself have been added over time, but the more things change, the more they stay the same. In an effort to keep players pumping quarters into arcade machines, computer-controlled fighting game characters could often pull off feats of reflex that would be physically impossible for you and I, but if you were able to overcome everything a game threw at you, the final obstacle would come in the form of an overpowered final boss. It makes enough sense that the last fight of your run would be the most difficult one, but some of these characters are so powerful that it's obvious that they were never meant to be controlled by humans at all. These characters' toolkits include, but are not limited to, touch of death combos, unblockable setups, unpunishable special moves, and other mechanics that will smother any hint of a real competition. There are some occasions where developers will tone the character down in versus mode, but other times they'll give you access to the unnerfed version via hidden code, which can lead to some pretty interesting debates on the character select screen. All right, time to play some Super Turbo with a good buddy of mine. What are you doing? You play Fei Long. For an infamous example, let's discuss Ivan Ooze from the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Fighting Edition for the SNES. This guy is probably the most broken fighting game character there has ever been. He's permanently in a state of flight so he can't be thrown or hit by lows and can't be stunned, and every single one of his six moves, most of which are executed with the tap of a button, would be good enough to be broken in just about every fighting game to ever exist. Boss characters like Ivan Ooze are banned because there's simply no learning how to fight against them. If these bosses were allowed in tournaments, Grand Finals would almost always be boss versus boss, and you'd be at a nearly insurmountable disadvantage in character select if you didn't pick them. There's no getting better against the SD Akumas and Omega Rugals of the world because even their greatest weaknesses are covered up by even more oppressive strengths. But once you move past overpowered boss characters into the meat of a fighting game roster, discussions about banning specific characters from competition get way more controversial. And to understand why, I'd like to talk about the concept of the matchup. Matchups are the result of a game community's ever-changing hypothesis about how one character can perform against another. Players base these conclusions off of a few different metrics. They look at their tools, advantages, disadvantages, tournament results, and personal experiences to see which characters stand above the rest in a hypothetical battle between evenly matched expert-level opponents. For example, in Street Fighter IV, 
Dalsim's long normals and keep away game wreak havoc on big bodied grapplers like T-Hawk and Zangief, meaning that between players of equal skill level, the Dalsim player should win 60 to 70% of the time. You could also say that Dalsim has either a 6-4 or 7-3 matchup against these characters. But just because he has good matchups doesn't mean Dalsim is actually all that great in Street Fighter 4. For example, if he fights an equally skilled Kami or Able player who actually has the tools to deal with his zoning, he loses these matchups 6-4 or 7-3. It's from these estimations from which tier lists are made. High and top tier characters typically have better matchups on average than the rest of the cast, and banworthy characters typically have overwhelmingly good matchups, losing or going even with few, if any at all. Every game will naturally have top and low tiers, but when a game has one or two characters who clearly stand above all others, there's a valid conversation that needs to take place among a game's community about how good is too good, and whether or not to swing the ban hammer. But matchup dominance isn't the only consideration you should make when thinking about character bans. Let's take a look at an old school example in the form of Street Fighter III Third Strike's Yun and Chun-Li. Easily the best two characters in the game, they had incredibly lopsided matchups with the game's low tier, handily beat most of the middle tier, and only had even matchups against themselves. If you don't believe me, take a look at the results from just about any random Third Strike tournament and count the number of Yuns and Chuns in the top spots. But despite their dominance, they were never outright banned because they were never really the only character you could use with any sort of success. Dudley, Ibuki, Makoto, and Kin players were still able to win major tournaments despite being at a natural disadvantage against characters in the top tier. So when you're considering banning a character for being too good, ask yourself the following question. Is one character making the rest of the entire game obsolete? If so, bring it up with your community and see if they agree. Run your own tournaments with a special rule set and see if it catches on. If not, maybe the character in question isn't good enough for a ban in the first place? But this kind of conversation has been re-litigated in recent years with Super Smash Bros. Brawl and Smash for the Wii U. Meta Knight and Bayonetta utterly dominated their games. Their worst matchups were 5-5 and they were considered to be overly represented in the professional scene. The difference here is that while the Third Strike community were able to reconcile with Yun and Chun-Li at the top, a huge portion of the Smash community wanted their best characters in the game banned outright. Meta Knight in particular was absurdly prevalent in the rarefied air that we call the top eight. Among major tournaments from 2009 to 2011, Meta Knight found himself played at least once by 44% of all top eight participants. And at one point in September of 2011, Meta Knight was actually banned from tournaments by the Unity Ruleset Committee the creators of a standardized rule set for Super Smash Bros. Brawl that was used in more than 150 tournaments. After that, however, the Smash community figured out why banning a character in a fighting game is so hard to do in the first place. Top players took one look at the proposed rules and vowed not to go to a single tournament with a Meta Knight ban in place, and tournament organizers from Meta Knight Heavy Areas protested the ban by disregarding the rule committee's decision when setting the guidelines for their events. The Unity Rules Committee eventually disbanded as creating a standard rule set for a Smash game proved too difficult. And as the Rules Committee faded, so too did the ban on Meta Knight. A similar resistance was seen during Bayonetta's Reign of Terror in Smash 4. The greater Smash community got flashbacks of their masked wing Spectre and decided that enough was enough. Crowds began to protest, booing Bayonetta players they have enjoyed watching in the past sheerly due to their choice of character. If you were playing Bayonetta in Smash 4, the crowd was automatically cheering against you. The difference there being that there was no governing body who was brave enough to ban the Witch Lady from tournaments. And as a result of the perfect storm of an oppressive character and an equally annoyed crowd, we got one of the most gloriously awkward grand finals to send Smash 4 off in one of its last major showcases. To send us in the grand final set number two. We ain't done yet, baby. Hold that gap. And get to the click clack. Let's do it. What's going on? What is this? I don't know. I was stalling for time. All right. The ugly truth of the matter is this. 
In order for a hard ban to be dealt, a character needs to be so disgustingly broken that a game's entire community from across the country recognizes the need for these kind of restrictions. Time is of the essence here, because the longer the ban can is kicked down the road, the more entrenched the users of these characters become, and the more resistant they'll be to drop their character because they aren't competitively viable anymore. Nobody wants to sink hundreds of hours in training mode grinding out setups only to be told that they can't use them in tournaments because a tournament organizer said so. But this is actually a catch-22. A community needs to come to a unanimous decision quickly, but you don't want to ban characters too fast because there may be a way to fight them, sending them down the tier list faster than Wesker from Marvel vs. Capcom 3. By not paying careful consideration, keeping your ear to the ground, and doling out bans where appropriate, you actually run the risk of shrinking your game's community, as was the case with Soul Calibur 4. There was a character in that game called Hilda, a knight from the Wolf Crone Kingdom who just so happened to have a combo so powerful that those in the community called it the Doom Combo. Named as such because thanks to a bug that happened when binding multiple inputs to the same button, Hilda could pull off a Tekken-style wall-to-wall -wall combo, ending in the opponent being launched out of bounds. This meant that one mistake sentenced you to a nearly automatic loss or being one mix-up away from tasting the earth outside of the ring. Just like that. Just Wait. like that. And then you hear the boost. Wow. High pressure. pressure makes us very excited. Yeah. That really long halberd. You, you have to play a very, very strong game to compete with a Hildy player that knows what they're doing. That was insane. Weirdly enough, though, Hilda wasn't as well represented in the top spots in tournaments as her perceived strengths would lead you to believe. She had what I'd like to call Vanilla Sagat Syndrome. Much like the Muay Thai specialist from Vanilla Street Fighter 4, Hilda's game plan completely crushed players who weren't among the best in the community. Even then, she still got slapped with a ban because Hilda's specific brand of nonsense was still overbearing to the 99% of Soul Calibur 4 players who weren't the top of the top of the top causing them to leave the scene for other games released around the same time, like Tekken 6 and Street Fighter 4. It ended up taking years of discussions, hundreds of forum threads, countless pages of arguments, and a lot of hurt feelings before she was banned in the most widely used tournament rule set. Ultimately, it was too little too late, as the game was years old at that point and most of the community had already packed it up and left for greener pastures. Now, I would like to say that the cases of Meta Knight and Hilda are incredibly rare. As I said, banning characters is kind of the nuclear option in fighting games, and the preferred method of dealing with these overtuned characters is to take them into the lab and figure out what your character can do against them. And if you're not fighting somebody like Pet Shop from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, there's at least one technique you can use or character you can learn how to play in order to beat any problem you're facing. Banning characters won't solve every problem with game balance, and in some cases, could actually even make it worse, like in a situation where banning the top characters in a given game only served to make the next tier down an even more oppressive god tier. After all, banning top tiers like Chun-Li won't do anything for the low tiers like Q, Sean, or Oro. Character bans have always been a very controversial and heavily debated step in the grand experiment of the world of competitive fighting games, and I hope that I've helped you understand why. If you want to read more about these types of topics, I recommend reading The Culture of Digital Fighting Games, Performance and Practice by Todd Harper, as well as some of David Serlin's writings on the topics of bands and matchups in fighting games. I'll add a link to both in the description below. I'd like to thank my Patreons again for their support, and once again, please feel free to hit me up on Twitter, and please subscribe to my channel. Have a great day, everybody.